A sorcerer is synonymous with a magician, a soothsayer, or a wizard. Sorcerers dealt in incantations and divinations. Steeped in deep science or rites, they boasted of a power to commune with the spirits of the dead. They convinced the dead to reveal information on subjects beyond our reach. Some used herbs, secrets, or incantations to expel demons. Sorcerers deceive people by pretending to foretell the destinies of men. They look to the movements of the planets and stars or to cure diseases by repeating esoteric phrases. Sorcery is the use of spells, divination, or speaking to spirits. The Bible condemns it. The word sorcery in scripture describes an evil or deceptive practice. In Paul's day, the word meant dealing in poison or drug use. It was applied to divination and spellcasting because sorcerers used drugs along with their incantations and amulets to conjure occult power. This video looks at the 12 instances of sorcery in the Bible to understand why God condemns it. Sorcery involves dark rituals involving entrails, images, and rods. Ezekiel chapter 21 verse 21 speaks of the king of Babylon using divination. This means seeking an omen or gaining guidance from superstitious devices. Three methods are available to Babylon's leader. He shook arrows and let them fall, then read a conclusion from the pattern. He looked at teraphim idols or examined an animal's liver to gain help from his gods. In Chaldean culture, evil spirits prowled around the dead bodies of the Chaldeans, either to feed upon them or to use them in their sorcery. If the spirits slipped into a corpse, they returned as vampires to feed on the living. Egyptians believe that Isis practiced sorcery. Her mouth is full of life-giving breaths. Her recipe is for the destruction of pain, and her words pour life into breathless throats. In 2 Kings chapter 23, the godly King Josiah destroyed all the images of abominations in Judah and Jerusalem, along with the familiar spirits the wizards, and the idols. Josiah became king at eight years old and reigned for 31 years. He led the time of national repentance and many reforms, including the cleansing of the temple from all objects of pagan worship. He demolished idolatrous high places in the land, restored the observance of the Passover, and removed mediums and witches from the land. Lastly, a rod is often used during sorcery rituals with the most infamous example in Exodus when Janus and Jambres conjured serpents from their rods, only to be swallowed up by Aaron's rod. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, God forbids sorcery alongside acts such as consuming blood, using enchantment, or observing the times. God cuts off anyone who turns his soul after spirits or wizards. To enter the promised land, we must not learn the abominations of those nations. Ezekiel 21 speaks of the sorcerers producing false visions and lies if they sense vanity. The idols in Zechariah 10 talk about vanity. In the same passage, the diviners see lies. They told their listeners of false dreams and offered vain comfort. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Satan is described as having the powers and signs of lying wonders. In Malachi chapter 3, the prophet was against sorcerers and occult practices when he spoke of a refining process for the repentant Jews who acknowledged their Messiah as they prepared to enter the kingdom and worship the millennial temple. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 2 says, Thus says the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations, nor be dismayed at the signs of the heavens, because the nations are dismayed at them. Gentiles or non-Israelites worship celestial bodies, including the sun, moon, and stars. Prophet Micah laments the punishment of false prophets who stand guilty before the judge because they misled people. They prophesied peace when they were fed but predicted war when they were hungry. Like the rulers, they were motivated by greed. Since they blinded others, they will be struck with blindness and silence. Balaam was a wicked prophet, but not a false prophet. Balaam heard the voice of God, and God gave him some accurate prophecies to speak. Balaam's heart rebelled against God. He betrayed Israel and led them astray. While not explicitly called a sorcerer in the text, Balaam is a non-Israelite prophet who is requested by Balak, the king of Moab, to curse the Israelites. 
God intervenes, and Balaam ends up blessing Israel instead. Belshazzar, the last king of ancient Babylon, reigned briefly during the life of Daniel the prophet. Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson through his daughter Nitocris. In Daniel 5, King Belshazzar holds a grand feast and drinks wine using sacred vessels from the Jerusalem temple. A mysterious hand appears and writes on the palace wall, striking fear in his heart. The king summoned the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. He asked Babylon's wise men to read and interpret the writing. He would award this man purple clothes and a gold chain and make him the third ruler of the kingdom. No one in his court could read it. Daniel is summoned to interpret the writing. It foretells the end of Belshazzar's kingdom. Despite rewarding Daniel, Belshazzar's life ended that night, and Darius the Mede takes over the kingdom. In Acts 19, God works miracles through Paul to heal the sick and exorcise demons. Jesus gave his apostles authority over demons. Religious charlatans in Ephesus witnessed Paul's success in exorcising demons. They pretended to have unique, miracle-working powers. Siva, a Jewish chief priest, had seven sons who went around driving out evil spirits. They used a new formula invoking the name of Jesus. They said to the demons in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. A demon refused and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? The demon-possessed man jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. The incantations of the charlatans had no power, even if they mentioned Christ. The power to cast out demons belongs to Jesus alone. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, also known as Ilimus. He was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who wanted to hear the word of God. Ilimus made his living practicing magic and claimed to be a prophet of God. Bar Jesus means son of Joshua or son of the Savior. Bar Jesus feared losing his job with the proconsul during Paul's visit. He opposed the gospel and tried to turn the governor away from the faith. Paul, channeling the Holy Spirit's power, rebuked Bar Jesus and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything right you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now, the hand of the Lord is against you. You will be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Sergius Paulus became a believer. He was astonished at seeing Bar Jesus temporarily blinded by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, a priest of the cruel, sensuous, false god Baal. Jezebel and King Ahab gave birth to a son, King Joram, who also continued his parents' wicked ways. In 2 Kings chapter 9, Joram meets Jehu, the future king, who would destroy the entire house of Ahab. Joram asked if Jehu came in peace. Jehu replied that there would be no true peace in Israel because of Jezebel's influence. In her alliance with demonic forces, the queen lured Israel into demonic practices. Simon the sorcerer, found in Acts chapter 8, practiced sorcery in the city of Samaria and amazed the people with his magical abilities. He boasted that he was someone great and gained a following among high and low-ranking individuals. The people even called him the great power of God. When the evangelist Philip arrived in Samaria and preached the good news of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, many believed and were baptized, including Simon. He witnessed Philip's great signs and miracles. Peter and John visited Samaria during this revival. They found baptized believers who had not accepted the Holy Spirit, so they prayed for the new converts to receive the Spirit. Peter and John laid hands on the new believers and gave them the Spirit. Simon saw this and offered them money to obtain the same ability. Peter sternly rebuked Simon saying he had no part or share in this ministry. Simon's heart was wrong before God, and he must repent of his wickedness. The erroneous Simon realized his mistake and asked Peter to pray for him to avoid the consequences. Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Isaiah 47 describes the humiliation of Babylon. 
the Lord's vengeance, the consequences of Babylon's arrogance, and the ineffectiveness of Babylon's wise men. The chapter begins with a call for the virgin daughter of Babylon to descend from her throne and sit in the dust, foreshadowing their disgrace and humiliation. God reaffirms his power and authority as the Holy One of Israel who will bring retribution. He reproaches Babylon for showing no mercy and relentlessly oppressing his people. God challenges Babylon to summon her sorcerers and astrologers to save her from the prophesied disaster. Babylon relied heavily on those who looked for combinations of stars, watched conjunctions of heavenly bodies, and placed importance on months of births and the movements of stars to predict the future. Isaiah sarcastically points out the futility of such trust. This ancient deception is still popular today in the widespread use of horoscopes. The Egyptian sorcerers, Janus and Jambres, were two chief magicians who opposed Moses and Aaron. Exodus 7 describes a scene where Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians did the same things with their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Later, the Egyptian sorcerers replicated changing water into blood or summon hordes of frogs but they couldn't duplicate the other plagues. Isaiah 19 documents the prophecies involving God's judgment on Egypt. The chapter begins with a vivid image of the Lord riding on a swift cloud, heading towards Egypt. The idols trembled at his presence, and the hearts of the Egyptians melted with fear. Egypt experiences internal strife, brother, against brother, neighbor against neighbor. God hands Egypt over to a harsh ruler, a catastrophic ecological disaster unfolds as the Nile River dries up. This impacts Egypt's economy, leading to crop failure and despair among the people. Egypt's leaders are portrayed as fools who have led the nation astray. They seek guidance from idols and spirits, but find no answers. No one can offer wisdom during the crisis. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas traveled to Philippi to share the gospel with a group of women by the river on the Sabbath. Lydia and her household believed and were baptized. On the way to the place of prayer, Paul encounters a slave girl possessed by the spirit of divination. She earns her master's money through fortune telling. She followed and shouted at Paul and Silas for several days. Paul turned to the spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Her masters, seeing their hope of profit gone, imprisoned Paul and Silas. In prison, an earthquake opened the prison doors and unlocked their chains. On his way out, Paul leads his jailer to salvation and leaves the city after proving his Roman citizenship to the magistrates. The Book of Nahum speaks of God's harsh judgment on Nineveh. The Lord's word to the Assyrians is dire. I am against you, I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword will devour your young lions. I will leave you no prey on the earth. The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. Nahum chapter 3 verse 4 chastises Nineveh for embodying the mistress of sorceries and that they sold families by sorceries. Nineveh had long been an enemy of Judah and Israel, the people of God. In 722 BC, the Assyrians defeated the northern kingdom of Israel, destroying its capital, Samaria. In 701 BC, the Assyrians nearly conquered Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. The Witch of Endor is the only biblical account of a seance. In 1 Samuel 28, King Saul is desperate and fears an impending Philistine attack. He consults a medium in the city of Endor against the direct laws of God. Samuel was dead, so Saul sought direction from the Lord through other means. God was silent because of Saul's disobedience. Saul had previously expelled spiritists and mediums from the land, but some remained. Divine law forbids mediums and spirits in the land of Israel. Saul disguised himself and asked the witch to bring up the spirit of the deceased prophet Samuel. The fearful medium screams in surprise when she sees Samuel. Samuel prophecies that Saul and his sons will die in battle the next day. Israel will fall to the Philistines. 
the Witch of Endor expected to hear from her familiar spirit, but was startled to see Samuel. In this case, God allowed Samuel to return to give King Saul the news of his coming defeat and death. Sorcery remains alive and well in the present day. Revelation 18 verse 23 says a spiritual Babylon representing a false system of the last days will deceive all nations with sorcery before judgment falls. The book of Revelation also predicts that the sorcerers will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. James in chapter 3 verse 15 mentions that there is wisdom that is earthly, unspiritual of the devil, which are all hallmarks of sorcery. Our wisdom should come from the Lord, not from deceiving spirits.